started. Just as a reminder to everyone, the copy of the o Open Meetings Act is in the folder on the door against the wall. Can I get a motion for the approval of the minutes from the September 16th meeting? Motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Um, and I would just like to take a minute, um, for those of you who've not yet met him, um, Bobby Warnley, would you stand up? Hi. <laughs> City and Owner IT Coordinator. Always We'll move on to standing business. Before we get to standing business, just uh -oh. for anyone that might be confused about the gentleman sitting to my left and the gentleman sitting to my right, um, we're in the heart of our, you know, thank you, Bob. For <laughs> he doesn't have a name anymore, he's just a number. <laughs> um, so we're in the heart of our United Way campaign right now, and we do a bunch of great events. Andy's our chair, Andy Clark, he does a fantastic job. We try to have a lot of fun with it. We did a foot golf charity charity tournament. Talk to Andy about what that is if you've never heard of it. We've done a lot of fun things. And one of the things we do is you can put a manager in jail. Um, and so we have a bidding process, and it gets pretty intense, as you can imagine, for the two to three hour. Uh, so um, I had to I had to up bid to get Tom into that, but I'm due at three o'clock. So I think we have a hard stop to stop this meeting at two fifty nine. <laughs> so if we could hustle through it, that'd be great. No, but it's a really good event. I think, Andy, if I'm not mistaken, just on the jail thing, we've raised by $400. Like that. So it's uh, it's gotten to be a lot of fun around the office, and uh, everyone's embracing it. So that's what's going on here, in case you're wondering. So with that, I don't know how you're going to top that, Julie. But you know. <laughs> no, no, I have like a ton of slides this time. <laughs> All very exciting ones, as usual, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah. Okay, but I am starting off a little bit different. You guys have seen this slide before, and some of you just saw it, but... We are today reporting all of the hours that are directly asked for by the customers year to date. So this pie chart, if you saw before, we had looked at this going into 2015, basically saying an individual's time is generally broken out between these four areas, projects, service requests, incidents, and other. And this is a challenge that dot-com folks have every day to manage all these things. We have focused for the last year and a half on the project piece with bucket hours and reporting that. Um, but that is only a slice of the pie, and our hope is going into 2016 that we'll be able to have reporting on some of these other areas too, because that is that is what the city and county are paying for, all this work that is to be done. So um, what we have on here is, this is showing by city and county, let's get the pointer here. The blue is the project hours, and the dark blue are the project hours that are attributed just to the city or county. The light blue are the ones that are the enterprise, which we have in the past to split those 50-50. What the red shows is service requests, and what the green shows is, is incidents, and what this chart is is hours. Um, so if you look from a, you know, from a city county perspective, actually the, and the numbers are down here if you can see them, the city actually has year to date, this is through the end of September, um, has a little bit more hours in incidents, the county has a little bit more in service requests. Um, certainly it is the project area where, as we've seen over the months, right, the city has had less hours. I put these numbers up here. If I were to look from the cost model perspective and just do a purely split, it has generally been 54-46. Um, 54% the county is using those services, 46% the, the city is using. And so what we show here year to date on these hours is 44-56. So it still shows that, you know, that as a percentage, the city is behind a couple percentage points there but it's fairly close when I look across the board there. So again, this is what I'm hoping that we can start looking at more in 2016. And part of the cost model is we're actually um, having, the, oops, having the service owners estimate all of these buckets, whereas in the past we were just focusing on project. Okay, any questions, that makes sense? Bucket hours. Bucket hours for service requests. Mm -hmm. Now incidents, I will tell you, we will probably always handle a little bit differently because those are things that are broken um, and the focus there will be more analyzing those and trying to get those areas where we can fix things so you have less incidents uh, but that's not something that you want to put a cap on or stop because if people start doing wacky things. Service requests though is a huge part of the pie and it's something that we'll probably be spending more time on and there are already some services like with the Oracle team where they are prioritizing those service requests. So I think the, the, your point is valid and we want to look at service requests and making sure those are going through an approval 
process. There's going to be some that will never go through the approval process. We'll categorize those as such. We also have seen a shift where in the past we might have done a, something we knew happens every year. Oh, we'll just do it as a service crest. We've seen those shift the projects too, which is a good thing because then they get prioritized, they get looked at. Obviously, they're going to happen, but we've moved those hours to projects as opposed to having to be service requests. We're going to dig deeper in. Right. But still, if you look at the total about total hours spent over all of those things, it pretty much breaks out pretty darn close to the cost model. Right. It does. Yeah, it does. So you're saying that validates the cost model? Yeah, I There's did a that. correlation okay. there. <laughs> correlation is not causation. So. <laughs> all right. So this, we're getting into the standard slides here. So for September, we had about 2,500 project hours, a little bit lighter than in the past. We're at 66% year-to-date for all of .com. Now, if we were doing a straight line through the end of September, that would be 75%. As we've talked about in the past, we are behind. We will probably end the year behind, largely because we had some resource issues through the year that we had positions that we hadn't filled. Um, here's the bucket hours total. So again, city, county, enterprise. This shows year-to-date and the percentage of where we are in the total, and that breaks out. If I look here for the month of September, um, this is the same chart we've seen now for months on end here. The, the enterprise has 12 projects. The city was up a couple with 21 pr projects, and Bobby, for your, for your edification, what this is is number of projects that had hours attributable to them. So this includes active projects, but it also includes projects that we are doing an estimate for or whatever. This is purely a count of projects that had hours applied to them. County had 29, and then what's underneath there are the top three um, projects as far as hours for the, for the month of September. Uh, I would tell you for the enterprise, those three have been the top three now for a few months, so that's the Amazon migration, OBIE, and the SQL upgrade. Um, city, the planning PC lease was the top one, and that was new for that, for that month. A lot of good progress there. Um, EPA Superfund is also a new one on this top list. The city finance invoice workflow has been there for a while. And for a county, we had a couple of the big ones that, that finished uh, in the month of September. So their GTL has been up there for a while, but these, these are two new ones there as far as the clerk payroll reports and the Cigna. Okay. So shifting to back to the cost model, you've seen this chart now for a few months too. Here's where we are. We have this line item in yellow because we were behind. We had estimated that we would be done with the service budget for 2017 and the allocation metrics by October 9th. We are not. Um, still underway, still working those. Uh, Bridget's going to be presenting the 2016 budget today. We're still working through the 2017 budget. Um, but the whole project is not in yellow because we are anticipating that we still would, will be fine for getting this done by the end of the year. So. This is something I want you all to be aware of. Um, Part of the reason that we were doing the timing for the cost model like we were is that we wanted to get information out to departments sooner so they could give us feedback. In the past, we kind of completed it and then got out to them. So our plan is that as of next Monday, we're going to send out an email to the department heads and the other people that would have input on the cost model. And we're going to plan to send out three of these emails. The first one, we're going to give them their metrics for the enterprise services and the um, employee services. The second email is going to be on their applications. The third email will be a summary with the costs. Um, this is an example of what they will get on this first email. So these are the enterprise services, the employee services. What we're going to ask them is to really look at these allocation metrics um, and we'll have the backup detail with it and get back to us if they see any issues. So. For, for a number of these folks, they have seen this for now a few years. Um, for others, it might be the first time. But we have all the details behind it, and we're hoping that we'll get uh, people to take a look at this and get back to us. The more feedback we get, the better this will be. All right, that was it for my normal stuff. So now I'm going into Tracy's. Tracy's out today at an HR convention, so we'll go into the projects. So lots of projects. <laughs> huh? No. <laughs> <laughs> We have 58 projects that are active right now. That's up from 54 in September and a big queue here. Um, queue is good, I think, but there's you'll see the numbers there by city, county, and enterprise where those are. This is the enterprise portfolio. So if you saw there were 15 um, that are currently active, this is listing the top eight. Um, this, If you remember that Tracy's slide, she has details behind these, so I'll just jump into the details. First one there is the Windows XP. 
So this hasn't changed a whole lot from the last month. There are still 198 out of 2,000 plus. If you look here, it says 70 for the city, 95 for the county, 33 for other that have not been upgraded. But the majority of these haven't been upgraded for two reasons. One, either the department owns them and they haven't had time to do it, or two, there's software that doesn't work on anything other than XP and we're working through that. Given those two things, we've decided we're gonna close this project rather than keep it open and have all this reporting and all that on it. And those will be handled, turned over to Greg uh, and team and they will be working those. But this will be the last time you see this, so it'll be gone. Any questions on that one? So, All right. so as that continues, I mean, say it takes another whole year and stuff. What's the difference? So the good news is some of them, some of them bought it, have bought extended support, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. EMB. Right? Yeah. They have they have extended. So that's 32. That's a large portion of them. They bought extended support and patching for those XP machines. The rest, um, if we don't have a known roadmap uh, to address it, and then when we'll set that time frame and we'll look to Greg to really manage that, we'll start to get. Draconian, right? You start to say, "Hey, as turn it off." State, we're gonna, well, we're gonna remove you from the network, right? Whatever that means. So, so there's sure. a couple of examples, yep. like mm -hmm. where those machines are actually on our network, right? right. 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 For training, they like can wear one of those outfits, right? Isolated. <laughs> and so, exactly, we'll have an exception approval process, right? So it's an exception; it's still XP, but there's a reason for it, and it's on the list. And and so we'll we'll manage that whole process. Right? We I'm just curious from the expense perspective, right? I mean, extended yeah. support, I'm sure, as years and years. Go by, it gets higher and higher. Right. I mean, again, it's it's a pretty small percentage now of our total install base. We've got it down, and we and most of the large numbers, we know what's going on there, right? And for most of them, there is a roadmap to get those converted. There's a pretty small number of, of PCs that we're we're sitting there going, "Wow, we're going to have to upgrade the application or something like that." But as part of Greg's regular security update, we'll do a status update that on that in the future to say, "Okay, hey, we've got it down to where we want it," and we or we have. 14 exceptions and here's what they are and why they are. And to Diane's point, it's totally off the network. It's an isolated machine or if there's extended support or something like that. Okay. The next one is also one that we've now seen for a year plus in terms of managed print. And we're down to um, four departments. So this is one that we're gonna continue working. It'll still be a project and we'll continue to work it, but we're not gonna show it in this meeting anymore. Um, and I think on the city side, those two are both in progress and we're just waiting on that one to get started on the county side. So the, the question with this one will be kind of the next phase and I think we're still working through with bishops and how we're going to handle that. And for everyone's benefit, we'll, we won't show these slides anymore, but in November we're planning to have bishops come to the oversight committee and give a quick overview of the, what's happened over the last year and a half. The transition we've seen, some of the cost avoidance that's been gained by moving to this management solution, uh, it's, a pre it's a pretty good story, so we want to give them the opportunity to come and tell that, so we'll do that next month. Yep. Kind of close this out as a project. All right, Amazon Web Migration, BJ's going to give us an update on that. So, uh, this is uh, going on well. Uh, we went uh, live with City Law yesterday. We have about uh, four or five sites right now through different stages of uh, user testing. Some of them are waiting on content update, customer feedback, things like that. The next one in line is the public defender, and the, uh, we have also have the OFD coming up uh, in the next week or two. So uh, those will probably get pushed by a few days because of uh, some holidays that are coming on for coming up for our offshore team. But other than that, things are looking pretty good, and uh, the sites of migration are on track. And the next one, Bob's going to give us an update on SQL upgrade. So SQL upgrade is going well. Uh, the team continues to do. Apologies. Uh, the team continues to uh, move smaller databases. We uh, have the prioritized list from the city and the county, so we'll start to get those scheduled up. Uh, but everything else, uh, it's going well. So there's no no red lights or yellow lights right now. Bob has the next one too. And the upgrade. So we have five uh, more sites that are actually com uh, converting over to fiber uh, tomorrow. Uh, and again, everything's moving smoothly with uh, Cox. They're doing the build out, it's going quickly. Uh, we had a couple complications again early on in the project. We overcame those, and everything is mushing along. Okay, this is the county portfolio showing the top ones there out of the 20 that are active. Um, the top one there, the wireless at the health center is in closing right now. 
DTL is still in red, but there's some progress been made there in terms of they've agreed to um, have a dot com project manager help them keep a develop and keep a schedule, which should be able to get us to an end date for that one. Um, and the uh, electronic health records, there's just have still been some issues getting that MPLS circuit set up. A lot of that is having Dell working with the local tele telco. The date's just been pushed back on that one, so those are yellow. And as far as the city portfolio, a couple of them, the two up on top are in the blue are closing. Well, I take that back. The second one's closing. This first one there was OPD, Application Monitoring and Management. It's been been there for a while and we've gone through a number of iterations on it, but we are actually going to cancel that project um, just given what our tool set can currently do and what reporting we're going to do with that current curl tool set. That will be something that will probably be coming up later in terms of um, if we have it. I don't know if you want to talk to that one, Brad, but no. Okay. <laughs> totally got it off guard there. And then uh, the electronic patient care reporting is in yellow, and that's because th this has been going on for a while in terms of that the EPCR getting their um, software to production and available. It has just continued to, it's been the vendor driven, continue to extend down, and we're looking at a November date now, hopefully getting that finished. That's it. Bob, just to get through the SQL project on the capital side. So. So we have uh, five units down there, so we've been bringing one from the uh, State Patrol, uh, that's a good story, and I think uh, probably towards the end of the year we'll do a wrap up, uh, kind of give you a vision of what's going on down there, uh, but it's all good stories. Uh, Paul Blight, uh, Brad is still working with his team to kind of streamline those pieces and parts. Uh, at this point, I think uh, what we have is probably what we're going to have to stay with uh, due to funding. Incidents in SLAs. Uh, we had uh, four priority twos. Uh, all of them met SLAs. So this is where we're at now. So, uh, so all the red across the board were all meeting or exceeding. SLAs for service requests, same thing, exceeding. So this is the most current month. And if we look at the uh, overall, based on uh, the part or the uh, services that are out there, you can go through this. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, I highlighted the ones that did not meet. If you want to discuss those individually, uh, let me know. Average speed of answer, we're down to 19.45 seconds. Uh, so again, everything's looking good on the service uh, tech service of support desk. Co-Century, uh, year to date, they uh, average the advancers increase a little bit. Uh, we have given Co-Century uh, the end of uh, the year as the termination of that contract as we go into the 7x24 support. And then uh, CSAT scores, uh, incident response rate is at 27.8%. Uh, industry average is at 24.8%. So we exceed that. I thank you and all of your staff. Uh, make sure that they continue to put in those responses. Uh, and we are uh, currently we are exceeding uh, response rates and uh, satisfaction. Any questions? Yep. You you had mentioned something about fog light and funding. So we are. Still looking at maybe replacing that, not replacing that. What, I, mean, yeah, I, I didn't catch exactly what you said. Yeah, I'm I, don't, sorry. I don't think it's going to be possible to replace it uh, due to the value that we've already put into it. Uh, Brad's working with uh, Dell right now to try to get it streamlined. So the cost to replace uh, and/or outsource is greater than the monies that we would have to offset. So right now, um, it's a tool that provides a lot of value. Let's be clear about Foglight, right? It does a lot of monitoring. The, the area where it hasn't provided the value that we would have hoped is on the application monitoring side. So we're doing a combination of looking at how we can utilize Foglight as well as Brad's team is doing some manual efforts too on critical applications to say, okay, let's do a daily check on these apps and look at CPU usage and that thing. So it's soft dollars versus hard dollars that we're spending, right? 
Well, we're utilizing the tool that we have in place, which was always the intent. Right? I, right. I, I understand right. that, but I guess to, what I what I'm getting at is to replace it would be hard enough. Yes. Correct. And the, but when you're talking about it's manual enough. looking on a daily basis at applications, that it's because software. that and and it, what I'm what I'm trying to get to and not very well. Is that there's still an expenditure there, oh, sure. be it hard dollars versus soft I dollars. I what you're saying, but I think, and that, I and I think that's something that we need to think about. Yeah. In that, you've got a network and you've got applications, and nobody likes it when your application goes down. They love to have a, a you know a, 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 a call that says, "Hey, look, you're running out of hard disk space," or whatever the case is. And what we're relying on is a manual look of that. To a degree, for some, it's an extra level. I mean, Foglight provides, we have monitoring tools within our virtual environment, but you're absolutely right, Deb. I mean, there's, you know, to go to that next level and have, you know, the, the view into the future before things break, you know, you got to make this software sing. Right. Uh, we've been able to do that to a degree, but not nearly what we wanted to, right? But again, we did a capital purchase here, you know, a long, long time ago to buy this, but there was no corresponding operational cost to, you know, but to, to that point, we've done. I think an admirable job of getting it to do the things we need it to do. But to, if we were to say, let's rip and replace and go with a new tool, we just haven't been able to put a business case together that makes sense yet. Okay. How many years have I done that? Uh, we have one. So we're down to, down to the last one. It's almost like that's a, another decision point to we sign a new support agreement. Right, right. Or do we roll about it? Or, yeah. So yeah. The, There's the, a lot of options. walk away from that pre the, the license itself is perpetual, so it's it, at the end of the maintenance, we get to continue to do it. And, and I want to do want to highlight what Derek was saying, the value that we get out of it. We do get a lot of value out of it on the back side. There's just some of those pieces that the gaps uh, for some applications that just fall through. Uh, the network, we've been tremendously proactive on that. So that's it's been helping tremendously yeah. keeping the, at least notices and everything else. And not everybody was here, but I think we did a demo about a year and a half ago, I think, that showed the, the dashboard that the guys use, and it has all the different switches and all the equipment and the red, yellow, green, that type of thing. And that, that's the type of stuff you'll never see, right? That right. just happens in the background, and they deal with it. I think we've come to the conclusion, based on experience, based on kind of what was sold four or five years ago as a tool that can do everything, that really doesn't exist, right? So you're probably looking at a parallel path. So if there's a business case to be presented, it's probably continue to use Foglight for certain things, but introduce a new tool to do the next level of monitoring that we're talking about. Okay. Or as Bob alluded to, is there a third party that can help us with that? We're still working the vendors out there to say, hey, you know, is there a managed service here that someone can do this monitoring for us at a cost that doesn't, that makes sense? Right. We haven't given up on that. I want to be clear. Uh, that, that's <laughs> yeah. so. Thank you. So, as you know, on the website, we've started leveraging the Amazon cloud quite a bit for our website migration. And uh, we are moving slow, we're learning fast, but we're thinking big. Another one of the big uh, factors to keep in mind is the cost as we move the migration to the cloud. We need to be cognizant about keeping our cost down. So, there. so here are the few things that we at .com are trying to do and save cost at Amazon. Just wanted to share a few of the things that we are doing uh, at Amazon. So there are five things we are kind of actively we engage, we monitor it, it's pretty complex. We have to go into the system regularly to make sure we monitor and keep making those changes. So there are five things we actively engage. One is the uh, reserved instance and use and optimization. What that means is uh, uh, by now we have a kind of a good measure of what our utilization is. So based on that, we go and buy the CPU, the usage, the bandwidth up front at a 70, 80% discount. So that kind of give, brings our cost down to almost 80% for the year. So we it's get- It's similar, BJ, to, if anyone has commodity buying experience, it's like hedging, it's like buying it, buying ahead, right, BJ? Yeah. Knowing yeah. what our volume exactly. is gonna be, exactly. it's, it's exactly. a similar process. Yeah, another new thing we've uh, started doing is for the reserve instance, there are a lot of other customers just like us who have bought those reserve instances but are not using it, so they even give us an even a further discount, so we kind of looking into that. We haven't started doing that. That will still bring the cost down, so I'm kind of looking at a couple of options there. So just for the last month, by doing switching some of the instances, we were able to save about $384. Well, that's almost 30% of our kind of our 
bill, monthly bill that we spend with Amazon. Another thing we're actively doing is the auto scaling, which is scaling our utilization up and down based on the usage. Uh, a few months back, I had uh, done the Google Analytics uh, with this uh, with this group. So, based on that data, we know what our peak hours are. So we kind of scale up during those times, and then after that, we scale all our servers down. So that way, we are able to save about monthly about five hundred twenty dollars. Well, just for a monthly basis, that's pretty significant savings for us. And then choosing the right instance. So uh, with Amazon, when you go, it's uh, pretty complex. They give you a wide variety of instances that you want to start off with so you need to know exactly what you need so uh, when once well, one uh, we, when we first started we went with a bigger instance but as we went into the program we realized that that was probably not, not the right decision so we scaled it down so based on utilization now we're kind of at the optimal level so you need to know what exactly what you're looking for otherwise you end up paying quite a bit more than what you need and then on the uh, instant utilization, so usually what we do is all our non prods we shut down after about 7 p.m. where we don't have anybody getting on the system, so that way we save a lot of dollars there as, as well. Any unused internet instances, the system will automatically shut it down and then bring it back next morning. And then we have about 41 alerts from coming in from the Amazon uh, monitoring tool, so we get all sorts of alerts, our performance, our security, our governance, our cost optimization, so we get a lot of alerts with recommendations as well. So uh, that's worked really well. So we kind of look into that almost every day. We look into that. Hey, hey VJ, one of the things I've also looked, I thought this would be a potential significant cost savings to migrate some of that hosting we have with Cedar Crestone to Amazon. Well, How is that looking to you as something? Correct. That's right, Joe. So uh, Hyperion is our number one candidate next to go on that one. So we do have uh, our Hyperion, I think, contract uh, to end of this year or ne early next year with uh, Cedar Castro. And once that expires, the plan is to move that instance here. Yeah, and I think that's yeah. going to be a pretty significant savings. Yep, right? quite a bit. So there we pay about 6700 right there. So we can break it down to maybe around 1000 or something. Yeah. Like we're learning here, right? The numbers don't look that big right now, but as we grow and put more and more on Amazon, it's got a multiplicative effect in terms of the savings that we can realize. And so Hyperion will be a good place to start. I will caution that, you know, somebody like a Sierra Cedar also provides professional services, right, BJ? So that cost is hosting and they're also helping. So it's not always, Amazon is a, is a place to store. Right. Yep. Or a lot of these things, it's who's your third party that's helping you, you know, keep patched, keep up to date and do those things. So sometimes, you know, you might read some of the paper, will someone cut their costs from this to this by going to Amazon? It's not always that simple, right? Because there's a third party component that we have to take into that's that's absolutely right and we have, we can look at different models we can host it with amazon we can have another third party manager so we have to kind of look into what works for us yeah. well, we see this as the future something we yeah. start, i know we kind of you know showed you guys a year ago this is where we're going bj showed you the analytics of what we can do we see this just becoming more of a more of an opportunity that inject flexibility into the system as opposed to making large capital purchases and then we also actively we uh, are looking at a lot of new services that Amazon offers, so we're kind of looking actively in, uh, looking into that. For for example, the Java platform that we currently have, that's another one uh, candidate we're actively looking into uh, doing a POC on. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Great. So with that, I think the, it's 3 o'clock, so I think the meeting's over. <laughs> <laughs> Motion. <laughs> I was out of order, wasn't it? <laughs> you need a gavel. Uh, no, he can't. He's tried for years. <laughs> Everyone can't. focus on Greg. <laughs> um, so this is a pretty uh, exciting time with Cybersecurity Month Awareness Month is going on right now. Um, one of the big things we have is the new portal will be live next week. Um, that also will include uh, the .com new website. So um, definitely we'll be sending out a couple messages on that on social media, across the city, county contacts, all that and stuff. Uh, one of the differences for this one is it'll be open to the public. Um, and, and what makes this particular site different than some of the other security sites that you may go to is Jazz and I have gone through articles and we'll post things that are relevant for work use, obviously, things that you're going to want to be aware of, things that are useful for um, home environment as well, but also things that are relevant to local government. So 
Um, that's nice. So we'll, we'll send it out to some of the other um, state local government contacts and see if they uh, find any use and maybe they can contribute to the site as well. Um, the, so cybersecurity awareness month, we've traditionally done four different messages throughout the month. Uh, first memo went out last week on Friday. We'll get there. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, we'll, we'll send the rest of those out. I wanted to tie it along with the new website, but um, had to push it forward um, to get that out sooner than, than later. Uh, security uh, training. Showed a demo to the uh, security stakeholders. Um, got pretty good feedback. Um, definitely uh, the, the, the length of, of the training, some of the areas. So that's too long. Let's cut that. That's really good. Let's you know, reinforce that same idea. So um, we'll have that out at the end of the month. Um, and with that, it'll be delivered in YouTube format. So when we send that out, we'll, we'll send it to city, county, um, department heads. I'll follow up the phone calls to, to some people as well to make sure, hey, you got this, this is what it is. Um, and, and then we'll work with the departments to figure out how they want to then deploy that to their staff. Um, so that is a slide for us. So who stuck that slide in where it wasn't supposed to be? Yeah, I know. That. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That security guy should know that. <laughs> <laughs> I got one some tracking. Okay, so now for the really exciting part of the um, we have been watching our budget really closely this year. We are every month meeting and going over exactly what we're anticipating spending, and we're coming in really close to over 74% of our spending for the year, which is our goal is 75. Um, we're looking at coming in right in at exactly what our budget is for the year. Um, outstanding receivables. We did receive the payment for corrections, but the other um, three large invoices on there are still outstanding. Otherwise, this is, is significantly better. We have Karen now that um, is following up on all of our receivables. She's doing a great job of getting that cleaned up. Our cash balance um, is trending a little bit lower than anticipated. However, right now our receivables, um, the, the uh, more current and the one to 30 days past due is trending at about $2 million. So we anticipate that at the end of the year we'll get caught back up, up to the about the million dollars. Chargebacks, these are the these are the actual chargebacks that have been signed for the year. Does anybody have any questions on any of these? If you do ever have questions, please feel free to give me a call and I can go through the details of them. Um, these are all the city departments all rolled up, these are the county departments all rolled up. It isn't separated, you know, like these aren't the city central or county central or anything like that. These are for all the departments. So if you ever have any questions about the details of these, um, Now for our budget, for our 2016 budget, we're looking at a budget of 12.66, well, 12.6 million. Um, the items that, we, that we've identified that we need the funding for are service management, um, which is a new software tool um, to help us with managing.com. Um, the IT security analyst that is currently covered under a chargeback but will be absorbing the cost of our budget next year. The bandwidth improvements um, that have been going on for the city and county, most of those are city departments but some county in there. Um, the additional project manager, our health insurance is going up um, significantly next year and then the Google, Google Apps Analyst um, that is already on staff also handled as a chargeback this year that we're absorbing next year. And um, the web application support, which is a going to be professional services. Um, this is a breakdown of the estimated amount that's going to be by service. We're still working through the cost model, so the actuals are yet to be determined because as we're working through the cost model we're finding, we need to um, just shift a little between here and there. But um, the bottom line is it will come to the 12.6 Here's the, contribu the contributions between the city and the county. Um, the city is a little bit higher just because of the percentage um, 
for the fiber upgrades. So, and uh, are there any questions about the budget? This is nothing new. We, we presented this to the county board back in early 2015. Most of you have been through it in detail. Um, so it's more of a formality at this point. Okay. okay. Can I get a motion for the approval uh, of the 20? I think we need to make sure we're clear on is at the moment the city budget doesn't include enough to fully fund this. So Derek and I have talked about needing to kind of monitor this as we go. Right. And then, you know, on the county side, we talked about this too, is that, you know, we're off six months in our year. So when we did our budget, you know, we had uh, like a $205,000, $210,000 increase. And then when you did your budget for the full year, you, then you took that again. So the total is about four ten, but you know, that budget's never been approved. And, you know, at, at this point, I would feel comfortable that we would be flat. So it would be there. So the 16 budget is okay. But, you know, there's a possibility that if we lay flat, that means that you're going into your 17 budget down. But, you know, that's a risk that we'll just deal with at that time. But, you know, that's my only caveat. Yeah, appreciate that. I mean, given the way the two, you know, we have to create a budget for two different organizations that are on different calendar cycles, it creates a challenge. But at the same time, you know, we'll, you know this is nothing new. We've been talking about this for a year, right? What this number is, and like Steve said, we talk. We'll monitor this very closely over the next few months, and we'll adjust accordingly as we. Yeah, we'll all just have to kind of keep watching this. And you know, don't get me wrong, you know. 7.3%, I know you guys have a lot of worthwhile projects and you need it, but I know that's certainly significantly in excess. We've been giving guidelines out in the county of, uh, of 2%. And so it, we're always, this is always tough uh, in, in that they're worthwhile projects, but we're, we're under certain constraints. So if, you know, hopefully property values will go up or other things will happen, but, uh, when I know, at least from a county perspective, when we get the direction of no tax increase, then, you know, that's when we have to go back and, and be pretty miser in our budget. Yep, appreciate that, Joe. And then it's all, it comes down to these are the things we're being asked to do by the business. Add more of this, add right. more of that, right. add more of this. So we're trying to be sensitive to that. At the same time, working with you to make sure it's affordable. Yeah, um, yeah the commissioner's telling me now, they want to do a zero-based budget for for next year, so we'll see. So I, it, I guess the bottom line, there's still a lot of pressure on. Yep, we appreciate that. And I think that's just a product of the environment that we're always going to be in. Just sort of like yep, and I, and we get that. I mean, if you want me to respond, I'll. The only thing I would say is, for the last two years, we've given money back to the business, and you know, our budget in 2002 was 11.8 million dollars. So I think we've been good citizens for a long time. I know there's a lot of uh, ups and downs in that realm, but over the last three years, we've been able to put money aside to help offset capital expenses. I know you guys get that. I know you're sensitive to that. But at the end of the day, there's this big of a pie, and it's got to get split up between everybody. We appreciate that, and we'll work with you to do what it takes to, to make it work. To the extent everybody can eat at more city restaurants, that would help. <laughs> <laughs> make that yes, a point. Please, please go out to eat <laughs> in the city limits. Sure, can I ask a question just to, as we move forward? I think when I say watch this, I'm looking at, I'm probably more on Steve's side to see how his situation is going to move into the next year. As we get into January, obviously on January 1st, 2016, you know, we can make choices at that point and we'll have to make those decisions as a group to say, okay, if this is, if this is real, we have reserves that can get us so far, we may get lucky. Lucky is not the right word. We may have something not come to fruition or it's a, we could delay the payment until for so long 
we could talk about a chargeback scenario that we right. could lay. Because your so dynamics are a lot of that is people cost, yep. and a lot of that yep. is signed contracts. So right. I guess I'm just kind of wondering where are the knobs that you really can the short term knobs. Watch yeah, the short term knobs are what I just said, right? Uh, uh, timing. You know, maybe someone decides to leave the business and we don't backfill for a while to, while we wait for that. So those are the short, the long term knobs are more challenging, and I've talked to Steve about those, and those will be discussions we'll have as a city and county because it's hard to say we're going to take half of the security and get rid of it. Right, because well, you both right. rely on. Right. I just want to make sure we're aware of that. Right. 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 Verified. I just think there's limited hours. Safe. Agreed. Safe. Safe. So the rubber hits the road sometime in the first quarter, right? When 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 when, we, when the income doesn't match the outcome, and we'll have to have that discussion. But it, we don't want to panic until we know more as the year approaches. Hmm. You know, says. We are having discussion before there's a motion, and inappropriate probably in this instance. I'd like to make a few comments. Um, first of all, I've, I've been involved in the dot-com reconfiguration for years from the start. I was on the committee that developed this concept. And what I can say is where we are now is light years ahead of where we were. I think you guys have done an outstanding job getting us to this point. There's a lot more work to come. I understand that. I know you understand that. But uh, congratulations. You've done an excellent job. To this point, you know, we're, we're, there are a lot of different foundations built within that interlocal that we haven't addressed, and we will as the time becomes appropriate. Where we are now is it's about transparency. It's about, um, well, transparency yeah, is no the biggest one. Accountability going. is the other one. Uh, as st proper stewards of taxpayer dollars, I mean, that's what we have to, to be uh, really tuned into. And so when this came up, I contacted .com. I said, you know, can you send me over the specifics? I got the details. Bridget uh, sent over everything. Bob sent me the capital improvement plan. It's all there, and it's very nicely done. So you guys have come a long, long way. The cost model has been a huge step to getting this done. Having said that, we recognize, okay, we're where we're at. We've got to do some things differently. But a couple things I want to point out. First, the capital improvement plan is not part of this budget. It needs to be, okay? Uh, that's something going forward, okay? But that's right in your interlocal. It requires it to be in there. And, of course, the reason is, you can't keep coming back to the city and the county saying, I need a $10 million raise or I want another bond issue. It doesn't work that way. Uh, that is not, now that can be changed. We can have a discussion with the city and county to change that. But uh, as, as we mature here, we want to look forward to building that into the budget so that those folks, particularly in this case, Steve and Joe, have the opportunity to see what the real exposure is, understand it, and then uh, the IT coordinators can help them sell it to the people who are going to write your checks. Okay. Another issue that we, I think we need to explore, not today, not sometime down the road, is the chargebacks. Your chargebacks are running, based on these sheets, almost well, over $3 million on a $12 million budget. That's 25% increase over what's been approved. Technically, you don't have the authority to do that. Your budget was approved at 11.8. You're spending, if all that was spent, you overspent your budget. Okay, We have to develop a process. I don't know what it is, uh, but we need to be looking at that because that's 25% over what you had budgeted. Now, that's not part of the city-county ask, but the city-county's paying for it we need to figure out a way to get you the authority to say, okay, you can sign that stuff, but we have to remember, yeah, maybe the department or the city or the county, whoever it is, has got the money to, to sign those chargebacks. You have to have the cash to cash flow it, okay? And my last little observation is, um, I think, and, and this group will need to have a discussion at some later point, your cash reserves are too low. Um, for an organization of that size, you want to have two months of operational budget. At best, you've got one. That's something else we need to talk about because it's a budgetary impact, 
particularly on the two guys to you know to the right here. But from an operational standpoint, and we can go and we can look at this and figure out how to do it, but that needs to be included. It's not there. Uh, so just things that, that we need to look for going forward. So um, the other thing that's in the inner local that we can cure right now is, is I would ask, subject to the understanding that, that um, as Joe and Steve have, have expressed, the city and the county um, the approval of this budget is still subject to financing or funding availability, avail funding availability both by the city and county. That's in the interlocal. This group doesn't have the authority to bind either one of them in that regard. So when we adopt the budget, it's a matter of contingent, contingent upon, funding. upon funding. And with that, I would ask, there is a section in the interlocal that says, we review and approve the budget, meaning this board, after we receive the recommendation from the city and county finance director. So are you folks in a position to recommend approval conditioned on funding? Yeah, I know. At the 12663034? Yes. Okay, then I would move approval of the budget at 12663034 conditioned on funding uh, with the understanding that we're not doing anything with chargebacks at this point in terms of approving it because it's not part of it, nor capital. Just the budget request that you've made, motion to approve. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you very much. It's always fun to get a budget approved when you're wearing this. Right? <laughs> 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 what kind of message is that? that so, um, just a couple oh. of quick updates. Yes. Sorry about that. So, um, we have selected for our insurance broker, um, Perry Cook, and the transition to that um, is in process. And for the financial audit services, we've selected Hazen Associates, and we're working on the contract with them. Uh, real quick on the organization, we didn't have anybody leave the organization in the last month. We did have someone uh, join VJ's team. Uh, Gorov Patel joined as an Oracle Apps developer, which is really helpful. I know that uh, uh, Shankar, you, you knew Shankar in the past, is it's uh, Shankar's replacement, so we're glad to have him on board and actively working. We've seen a, an uptick in that team for uh, productivity because of getting new people on board and getting that Oracle team coming down. So that's a, a great addition. Um, and the last formal topic we have as part of whole business day is just a real quick demo on electronic signature. Most of you, this is going to be pretty uh, uh, something you've already experienced. Uh, but Tom and Bridget are going to give a quick, a quick demo of the product we're using right now. It's called DocuSign. If you've ever purchased a house or been a part of a real estate transaction, transaction it's very popular there. Uh, but we're using it for our chargeback process right now and looking to expand that. So Tom's going to give a couple. Oh, we did have a couple slides. Didn't we? Sorry, I'll go back to a couple overview slides and we'll show a quick demo of how it works. Okay. All right. As Derek said, this uh, technology has been around quite a while and we're always looking for opportunities to improve business processes and, and leverage um, technologies that may help us do that. Um, John probably knows we've been talking electronic signatures in the uh, criminal justice space for probably 10 years and so that you know it's been in flux that sort of thing but I think the thing that you're seeing now is if you do a, a you know house a house transaction or a financial um, transaction or even if you go to the store you know the point of sale devices now all have electronic signatures and so forth so there's a lot of um, adoption of this kind of technology but there are also um, issues in regards to legal concerns about about them. So in the criminal justice space, you know, the, the state would um, have a policy on that uh, or, or a bill on that. Um, but in our realm, to leverage this technology, we just have to have an understanding that um, we're going to use it. So that's why we say legal concerns are lacking. <coughs> and what these, uh, um, so we We've been taking a look at uh, um, this technology and we put a proof of concept together. And what we're trying to do is improve workflows um, to 
you know, either save money or avoid costs. And um, the particular tool we use doesn't require everybody to have a license or be signed up. Um, and, and the process that we've uh, uh, done the proof of concept on is our, our chargebacks process. And you know, today, in order to do that process, um, or previously to do that process, you would have to print a piece of paper, you, the client, would have to sign it, you'd have to scan it in, send it back, just and that sort of thing means that we're printing a lot of paper in a lot of different places and throwing it away after we've got a stand back in. And, you know, that process had a lot of time inserted into it because the printer might not be ready or you don't, don't know how to scan something or whatever. So we we're finding lots of delays in that process. And overall, we were trying to do uh, improved administration and record keeping. So. Um, what we believe is happening now with that process is that uh, it's, it's an easier approval process um, to get those signatures, and it's easier for us to track too. And um, and there are other opportunities that we potentially notice out there. Just off the top of our heads, listed a few. Um, but with that, um, we'll do a demo. Unless anybody's got any questions. The tool that we use is DocuSign, and this is actually very easy and very efficient for us to use for the chargebacks. Apologize while that was signed in. Okay, when we go to create a chargeback now, all we have to do is leave this new sending a document, and I upload the document that we are wanting to send for approval. Where did we put that one? Okay. And while that's a ball point out, you can pull up any PDF you have. Right. And we happen to have a template for this, but if you have one that used to have places for initials or signatures, you just import that in. You don't have to recreate it or anything. So this is what what I just uploaded. It's just a fake um, charge back for a penny. But <laughs> Joe doesn't get mad later. <laughs> it's got your name on it, too. Um, it does. <laughs> well, I used his because they wanted to be able to show you what it looks like with the two different lines, you know. Uh, so some of the templates only have one line, so we have two. The bottom, the approvals all depend upon who the chargeback is going to, what the dollar amounts are, those type of things. So. All right, now in order to add, um, put the air, add who's going to be approving it, I'm just going to put this one in for me so that I can show you. And um, I put that I need to sign it, and then I'm going to put Derek just so that there. No, because you're not, so here we go. I think this is one of the advantages. Like I don't have an account necessarily, so they can just send it to me, just to my email address. I never have to sign up for DocuSign, remember another password, anything like that. So now all I have to do is hit next, and it will bring up the document that I just uploaded. And I will be able to put in, so I want for my signature, okay, signature. That there because I want my signature to go there. Then I want to put that it's in the date that I sign it. And now I'm going to put in Derek's and that I want his signature to go here and the date he signed it here. We also, for the city, use some initials. And so I can set it up that I want someone else. I could have another person in here and I can put that I want somebody to initial right here. Um, or I'm going to take that off. <laughs> I'll just leave it this one. I'm not as good at this as Shelly is. Shelly does all of this. So <laughs> um, then all I have to do is I hit send. Actually, I'm going to move your stone onto your line. Oh, there it is. Thank you. Okay. So I hit send. And then it will come up in my email.
and it will come up looking like this. And so then I just hit the review document. And there's this little box that I need to check that I'm saying I approve that I'm signing this digitally. So continue and click on the start and it'll take you down. So I just click this sign and um, this is my signature then, how I have it set up. I hit adopt and sign. And now it's approved and it's sent on to Derek for his approval. And I was gonna do it on my computer, but I think I'll do it on my phone just to show you, you can actually sign with your finger too. You can use one of the pre-made pre ones or you can actually do it. Plus you can actually put an electronic generated. And I wonder if you could default to that too, if you needed to, you can actually sign with your mouse too. There's, yeah. you know, there's different ways of doing it. So I got, if you, I know you can't see this, but I have the same screen that says I consent. I go down to the signature line and then I rotate my device. I'll sign Mickey Mouse, or, so you can actually sign with your finger, adopt and sign. And that's it, finish, and then it'll send a notification to everybody that it's finished. And on our side, I would say a couple things. It makes my signature look much better than my actual signature. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's, like, so it's legible then. Right? Yeah. 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 And the other thing is, since we're doing file bound or attempting to get file bound there, our team is kind of the total keep this in mind and see if there are applications where this would fit the file. Yep, and we know there's integrations between the two. Um, and the good news is, I don't know, Bridget, if you want to show you, probably got an email that said it's all completed, right? Right. Oh, I will tell you, too, you can sign up for those of you that are going to be signing a lot of chargebacks. You can sign up for an account, and then you can see all the documents that you signed. So I don't need to because I don't normally sign chargebacks. Yeah, so I have my own account. So you? when I, could go, I go back and I see all the ones that are signed. Okay. So... So the thing I like about this too, if you scroll all the way to the bottom, everyone who signed gets an attached PDF of the finished document. So if you're some one of those people that likes to keep records or something like that, so as Joe said, he can go into a DocuSign because he has an account and see them all. But let's say you only do two or three of these a year, you'll also have an email with the PDF of the finished document of everyone's signature. All right, any questions on that? No, it's a, it's a nice tool. Yeah, I like pretty it. slick. I think, you know, as you start to think through it, you know, you, we just showed you, this is signature and date. There are a bunch of other fields. You can have someone add text. You can have them, you know, approve. This one just went and blasted both to Bridget and myself, but you could have a whole chain of approval that goes up and actions to take as you go through. So we think there's a lot of potential here. So thanks for looking at it. I think you're going to see more and more of this in the future. Back. So I think uh, that does it for... Um, Old business, one new item, and it's very brief. A lot of you attended the tech fair a week ago today, I believe it was. We just wanted to, we took some pictures of the of, uh, different exhibits. Thought it was very well done. We got a lot of great feedback on it. The vendors were happy, the people that walked around. You can see the list of folks we had there. A nice cross-section of consumer and business products. Um, we had three demonstrations. We learned a few lessons about maybe putting those on people's calendars so they remember them. Um, but they were really good, a good cross-section. We had a couple of uh, hacker type people that you know really showed you the behind the scenes of what these folks are looking for when they're trying to fish information or get information from you. Great uh, demo on Windows 10 and a really good uh, dialogue with some folks about Google Hangouts and how that's gonna work. So we were real proud of this. Again, every year we get a little better. We learn a little something about how we can make it better the next year. For those of you that attended, I hope you enjoyed it. We'll do it again next year. That's all we have for uh, our piece of the demo. All right. Any public comments at this time? Seeing that there are none, our next regular meeting is November the 18th at 2.30 in this room. Uh, can I get a motion to go into executive session to discuss personnel issues, please? Motion. Second. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Can I get a motion to remove this ridiculous outfit? <laughs> is your hour up? <laughs> no. I don't think so. No, you got a half hour.